Nebuchadnezzar, the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God had wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. That's four. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. May the Lord bless this world in our hearts in the name of Jesus. Married but not mad. I, I don't want to describe marriage uh, because um, I'm not going to have such luxury of time to look at that. But of course you know it, that uh, today people, especially Christians, do not trace good things to their marriage. Most times, people have a lot of regrets, a lot of sorrow, a lot of calamities to refer to, and they look at their marriage as the root cause of such problem. That's what the MC was trying to say. You see a man bubbling with vision before he gets married, and after marriage, he became the shadow of himself. Some of us were very vibrant on campus. Many of us served in campus as campus executives. And we are very good, very, very spiritual. But ever since we got married, the fire got quenched and we have become shadow of ourselves. You were called pastor on campus, but now no more. You are a complete opposite of who you were while on campus. And I asked myself why. I tried to find out why is it that people who carry some great things, great vision, as soon as they get married, something happened to them. A lot of women will be here and they will point to their marriage as a reason for their troubles. A lot of people will look at the day of their wedding and cost it because it became the cost of their pain, the cause of their sorrow, the cause of their calamity. Possibly yours is like that. But I am reading a man here, he was a king, and a gentile king for that matter. And by privilege, he had encounter with men like Daniel, men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who seemed to connect him with the God of heaven. And while he was talking about how gracious God was to him, he traced it back to his marriage. And I want you to see what he said in verse 4. Actually, he tried to put a memoir. He tried to write about his life. And I wonder in my heart if you're also going to write about your life. What will you say about your marriage? Listen to this king. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I know you may think that he's talking about the same place, but no. My house and my palace, they are two different things. My house talks about his home, his marriage. His palace talks about his office. He was at rest at home and flourishing in his palace. In my mind, I am not thinking that rest is an activity. I'm not thinking he's saying I had a siesta at home. I'm not thinking he's talking about having quietness at home or he's on vacation or he has gone on holidays. I am thinking that in this context, rest is a place. Rest is a position. Rest is an experience. And I wonder in my heart whether you also have that in your marriage. I am not saying rest is an absence of pressure or rest is an absence of tension. Actually, an artist was asked to paint peace. And I love what he painted. He showed a bird and he showed a very storming atmosphere. 
and the board patched and it was just at rest where it was not disturbed by the raging storm around and i think there is a need for me to trace that a little bit with you today i feel that with these few minutes that i have i will need to uh, ask you some questions you may not be able to answer but possibly you may be able to answer before God or right inside of you. I know that a lot of issues could happen when there is no... I write about David. The Bible said when God gave David rest round about from all his enemies, he called Nathan and he said, I can see that I dwell in a house of cedar. But the house, but the covenant, the ark of covenant dwelt among courtes. Can I build a house for the ark of God? And I asked myself, so all this while, when David did not have rest, he was blind. So I know that when a man does not have rest at home, he's a blind man, even though his eyes are wide open. When a man does not have rest in his marriage, he's a confused man. In fact, God is homeless in his life. But I like to describe, I like to I like to possibly check. So what was Nebuchadnezzar talking about? What brought that kind of glorious kingdom to him? What gave him such great fame? What gave him such huge success that he had in his life? Though a Gentile king who by God's mercy met some godly men that surrounded him. When he talked about rest, my mind raced to the book of Matthew chapter 11. And I'd like to read that very quickly. I'm going to round up in a short while because it's supposed to be a banquet. However, it is also critical that this exhortation should be brought. Possibly it may be of help to you. In Matthew chapter 11, I'm going to read verses 28 and 29. If I like, I will read verse 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. So I am thinking in my mind that when Nebuchadnezzar said, I was at rest, he looks to me as if he was saying, I was at Jesus, as though a place. It looks to me as he was talking about Jesus as a location, an experience, not necessarily having a siesta. I know you have a very serene house, yet not at rest. I know you have a very great and flourishing career, yet not at rest. I know you are struggling to keep your eyes closed in the night, to catch a sleep, yet you are not resting. You have changed your bed, yet you are not resting. You have changed your work, yet you are not resting. You have sometimes turned towards alcohol, yet you have not found rest. Sometimes you switch to chasing money, you have not found rest. And sometimes you chase women around and you think the more you sleep with, you will have rest. Yet you are still restless. You have changed your car. You have changed your status, and yet you don't have rest. Because rest is not in those things. Actually, money can buy you good bed, but won't buy you good sleep. You may have very great security around you, yet you are still feeling insecure. But so something is happening somewhere. Something is wrong somewhere. I like to say to you that it is not everybody who got the kind of experience you have. I am thinking that there is something that I want to ask you to look at this evening. Just in five minutes time, I should be rounding off. Jesus said, come unto me. And for me, I think that has to do with you living where you are and reporting at where he is.
If you must be at rest, then you must leave this addiction to porn. It won't give you the rest you are looking for. I'm telling you. I thought that when Jacob saw that the woman he slept with all night, only to discover that it was not Raquel, it was Leah, I thought that when he, would, he got Raquel eventually, he would be at rest. No, he eventually became a polygamist. He kept multiplying women, he was not at rest. The woman that Jesus met at Sychar in Samaria had married five men, yet she was not at rest. Because she can't find rest in changing husband. If you change this woman beside you, if you change this man beside you, you will still find rest. Because the Bible talks about Jesus, that by him all things consist. Remove him, everything scatters. Say, so come unto me, all ye that labor. You are looking for rest, you have multiply certificates, you are still not having the rest. Because the one who is the true certificate is missing in your life. Is missing in your marriage. And that person is Jesus. I wish I can talk about him tonight. I wish I can talk about Jesus here tonight. Because I see that you have a lot of wisdom. Street, you are streetwise. You, are, you have intellect. You are an intellectual but you still have no rest. You know why? Because in him was life and still life. And in him is light. So when a man loses Jesus, he loses life, he loses light. Have you seen that civilization has not helped us? And has not helped our marriage? Because civilization is not light. Christ is the light. Have you seen that education has not helped us? You see two educated men getting married. Men, educated, intellectual illiterates. Two women getting married. One is a husband, the other one is a wife. And yet the two of them are females. Has education helped us? Has civilization helped us? Because the true civilization, the true light, the true life, is Christ. When a man refuses to live where he is and come to where Christ is, of course, he will be restless all his life. He may smile. He may wear nice dress. He may ride nice car, posh car, state of the art. Yet, he is still restless. I know that we are well dressed here, but I don't think that that is how you are well dressed inside. I'm not thinking so. You look cute, but I'm not sure that is how you look inside. There could be confusion going on inside. Why don't you live where you are and come to him who offers rest? Say, come unto me, all ye that labor, all ye that struggle, and are heavy laden, and I will give you. It's a gift. He's not going to ask you to pay a dime. It's just for you to live where you are and come to him where you are. He is. He said, come unto me. So I know that rest, number one, is to come to Jesus. Number two is to come with Jesus. He said, take your, my yoke upon you and learn of me. So when you see a man who is going to be at rest in his marriage, then that man must have come to Jesus. I didn't find rest until I have found Christ also. In my marriage. We have spent 32 years together and it's still counting. And I trust that if the Lord tarries, we're still going to spend many years together as husband and wife. I'd like to say to you that what makes meaning in every man's life is Christ. As a matter of fact, if I sit down here to start to describe what Christ teaches about, about marriage, you'll be amazed as I close. I want to say to you that I read something in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. I read that scripture and we pray. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. Paul writing to the brethren in Corinth and he said, Have we not power to lead about his sister 
a wife, as well as other apostles, as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas, three types of people here. The apostles, the brethren of the Lord, that is the siblings of Jesus, and Peter. I like to say to you that Paul mentioned power here, but I saw two powers. The power to lead a wife and the power to follow as a wife. The husband has power to lead and the wife has power to follow. You can place order on any of the books written by Shegun Ario. Instruments of Revival, Seasoned, Broken and Binded, The Making of a Disciple, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Advancing God's Kingdom through professional platforms, Raising Pure Children in an Impure World. Single Without Sage, which is also in audio CD. To place your order, please call 0803-438-3636. God bless you. And Paul said, we have that power. He was talking about the rest of us. He said, have we not also have that power to lead a sister, to lead a wife? Just as other apostles are doing, just as the siblings of Jesus are doing, and just as Peter was doing. Now, I'd like to close with that. I like to say to you that you may not find rest in your marriage. As a matter of fact, your marriage can become a mirage when, as the husband, you lose the power to lead. Somebody asked me a question this afternoon, and he said, When God said to Eve, Your desire shall be to your husband, is that a blessing? I said, It's a curse. Because God designed that every man's desire should be towards him. God never designed that a woman should solely depend on her husband. She was, to be, she was meant to be a help, a supermarket. Everything her husband is looking for should be found in her. That's what I read in my Bible. And I told her, I told the brother, I said, it was a cause because God said, to him shall be your desire, and he shall rule over you. When you see a man who depends on another, he's a slave. The other man takes advantage of him. When everything that you need in life is in the hand of a man, of course, he will take advantage of you. And so, what do we do? We need to understand that there is a blessing that God brings upon a woman for her to be a help, not a helper. A help. But when cause came, she became the help that God made became one that needs help. I don't think that's the way God designed it. God designed that as a man, as a husband, I have power to provide leadership, not rulership over my wife. When you rule over your, over your wife, you will not have peace. But when you provide leadership for her, you will have peace. And as a woman, if you must also have rest in your home, you must also have the power, the grace, the grant to follow. I tell you, what gives me peace between me and Jesus is that I'm just willing to follow him. Whatever he likes, wherever he leads, whatever he wants. And that's what that sister said. She said, if my husband likes it, then I also like it. I'm simply a follower, not a shadower. A shadower is a spy. Who is looking for how to harm the person he is spying. But for you to be a correct wife, you must be a follower. Now, as I close, I want you to bow your head. Think about it. There is only one person that can give you peace. It starts not with your marriage. It starts with you. Weak blocks will produce weak building. What makes marriage strong are the individuals in the marriage. If the individuals in the marriage are weak, that marriage will be weak. If you don't have Christ in your life, there is no way you can provide and attract rest into that home. And your husband or yourself will not flourish in what you are doing. You may not know that that may be the secret of your stagnation because there is no rest in your home. So your palace is not experiencing that kind of flourishing that your heart desires. Is there anybody here today 
who is willing to allow Christ to come first into his or her life. Before we talk about allowing Christ to come into your home. If you are like that, you can lift up your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come out. Where you are, I just want to pray with you. You want Jesus to come into your life to give you rest of mind. To give you peace of mind. That he may settle your home and settle your life. Do I have anybody like that here tonight? Just lift up your hand. I just want to pray with you. And he will come into your family. He will come into your home and be of tremendous help to your marriage. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this moment. Thank you for bringing a short counsel and exhortation across unto us. Holy Father, I know that gracious is the word that comes out of your mouth. And I know that it will minister grace to the heart of those who hear. Lord, tonight, we see that a man like Nebuchadnezzar was married, but he was not mad. He had rest at home, and he flourished in his palace. Why can't I be married and yet flourish in my ministry? Why won't I trace the trouble in my business to my marriage? It is only when Christ, the rest, is not in my family. Lord, I ask for every home that is going through turbulence, for every home that is being threatened by the enemy, for every home that is peaceless, for every home that lacks rest in this place. I speak peace into such homes in the name of Jesus. I'm asking Lord Jesus, will you please come into these hearts who are willing to accept you into their lives, that you will come to indwell their hearts and you will bring peace first between them and God. And then you will bring peace between them and their spouses. That they may dwell together in peace and they may flourish in everything they lay their hands upon to do. Thank you because you have heard us again. For we have prayed with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.